Welcome and welcome to the 2017 National BMX Hall of Fame. Glad to have everybody here tonight. If you would, grab a seat. We are ready to start the program. I'd like to call to the stage the CEO of USA BMX, B.A. Anderson. Thank you, guys. Welcome to the uh, 2017 National BMX Hall of Fame once again, guys. It is great to have everybody here. And as I say every year, it's, it's like a family get-together once again. So if I could have all the current Hall of Fame members stand up, I know we, I have a list here somewhere, but not all of you guys that are on that list. But if you guys could stand up. Toby, guys, Dave Clinton, everybody stand up. Vance, the history of BMX right there, guys, our, our forefathers. Thanks, guys. But tonight is about celebrating our current inductees. We have Steve Rink from Powerlight, Misty Dong, John Pyant, Doug Davis, and David Volker, of course. So, so I got to say one thing. So... Doug, I, Doug probably doesn't even know that we raced each other, but at one point uh, I was way behind Doug. And uh, I did have the pleasure of Doug coming to my home track um, and kicking my ass anyway. But so thank you for that, Doug. But I did have fun chasing you around the, the track for those, those years. But uh, also we have some special guests here in, this, in the audience. Um, our first national number one amateur, Kyle Fleming. Carla and Paul Fleming, can you please stand? So Kyle obviously was uh, one of Doug Davis's main competitors as well, but it's great to have you guys here as well. And uh, Debbie Kelly, if you could please stand up as well. Her husband Pete Kelly is in the Hall of Fame as well. And my father, Bernie Anderson, I don't see him here somewhere. Where are you at, Dad? There he is, but the owner of USA BMX. Thanks, Dad, for a lot of years. But um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Cash Matthews, uh, our MC for the evening. He's done a great job for several years. All right. So thanks for coming, guys, and All right. thank Good you, job, Cash. Man. Yeah, you're welcome. Yep. Man, I can't see anybody. This is awesome. Man, what a night uh, this is going to be. This is going to be pretty cool. Um, man, look at this. Under the flags of the world, uh, the Olympic flame. If you get a chance, take some pictures under the Olympic flame. Uh, tonight, we're here to celebrate uh, the history of our sport. And cool thing about history, and for most of you, I think you'd agree with this, you don't know you're making history while you're making history. And a lot of us are in this sport just because we love it. And, uh, you know, we like to ride a bike and, and we like to do cool things. So thank you, everybody. Uh, there's so many cool people here tonight. I got to ride with Andy Ruffle last night and he left a skid mark. And so his riding skills are on par still. Uh, Ron in the back, who's run audio for us for, I think, nine years. Thank you, sir. You do such a great job for us. And, of course, all the people at USA BMX. And uh, we have a lot of dignitaries here tonight. Uh, thanks for mentioning the Hall of Famers. A bunch of my old friends from, uh, you know, grade school, high school. Bobby Encinas is here tonight, the very first Nora Cup winner. We're going to bring him up a little bit later. You know, what, what it was like then, it's very different now, and he came to Oklahoma the very first time, and he popped out of a van. I'd never seen a man with long hair. And uh, so I, I, my first words to Bobby Encinas were, what is that? <laughs> so uh, it's just good to have these relationships, though, over 40 or 50 years, and it's, it's pretty cool. So I'm reminded, uh, you know, how good our sport is doing. We had the Worlds here in America for the first time at the Rock Hill facility, a $7 million facility. And if you wait for some things to happen in time, the sport gets better. You know, in 1950s, the NFL, Johnny Unitas, made 9 to $20 a game. Tommy Lasorda pitched for the Dodgers and made $100 a month. And their sport in the 50s was about as old as our sport is today. And I want to tell you, just keep up the good work. We're doing some great stuff. You know, America, we got multiple world titles. In fact, I want to recognize the new title holders. We won the men's elite, 
the women's and the master's class. And I want to just call out, I don't know if Corbin is here. Corbin Shira won the men's elite. Corbin, are you here? All right, cool. If you'd stand up, please. Elise Post. Wow, Elise Post. Uh, we had Tyler Brown won the master's class. He's the fastest track operator in the world. So, in, in it, I mean, we're in a good spot. We won 53 medals. We kicked everybody's. Uh, I need John Paul Freeman up here to help me edit those comments. But we did very well, and as a as a group, we we should be very proud of the progress our sport has made. And you know, we've all been hanging out at Eddie's condo over there on the beach. It's awesome. And, and I want you to realize something. Here we are today, many of us in the sport for 30, 40, some even, if Scott Bright after here, we've had people here for 60 years in the business. That, that's supposed to be funny, by the way, help me out. <laughs> but there are not a lot of little leaguers at the age of 40 and 50, little league baseball, football, basketball, not a lot of little leaguers getting back together with their competitors and friends 40 years later to talk about how great it was. And here we are tonight doing just that and celebrating. And, and tonight, we genuinely get to celebrate the heroes of our sport. We get to celebrate their accomplishments. We also get to, us to celebrate the sport itself and how great BMX is and how many people are, are just, they're eating up with it. And I, I love that guys like Gork that are, you know, kind of old guys now, but they still love racing BMX. I meant that with love, Gork. Yeah. Tonight, we're here to celebrate those of you who one day will walk across this stage. One day, many of you will walk across this stage. Tonight is a night of celebration. Tonight is also a night of redemption. We have people in the audience tonight who faced great tragedy, great trial, great challenge. Eddie King is walking, you know, without a wheelchair now. I get to spend time with him. Love you, Eddie King. You inspire me. Uh, Andy Zerzo had a bike wreck. He's walking now, and he can't be here tonight, but man, keep the prayers going for these people. Uh, my, my great friend, Ken Pliska from Oregon, 20,000 point club, had a horrible stroke. He'll do anything to get attention, and it, 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 just, it just didn't look so good for him, and he's here tonight. He, yeah, love you, Ken Pliska. Tonight, we have to say goodbye to some people uh, that we lost along the way. Bob Gonzo Hunt, many of you knew him, Missouri guy. Uh, lost him a few months ago. Uh, what, what, a, what a great guy he was. And, uh, and what an epic night that we're inducting one of the greatest writers ever from the Midwest with John Pyant here just in a little bit. Uh, we, we, last weekend from Nebraska, we lost Randy Gibson, a friend of so many of you, and he helped start the sport of BMX up in Nebraska and just created that scene. And he was killed in a bicycle car wreck. And, uh, you know, so tonight, let's remember how good each of us really has it. Um, thank you. Yeah, let's clap for those people. So change happens. The people I just mentioned had change come into their life and they fought back. Change is coming. Change is coming to BMX. Change is coming to the Hall of Fame. One day we won't be in this facility. We'll be in one better. How many of you Hall of Famers were in the room in Tulsa that wasn't very, it was about as big as this stage and there was like a free buffet and you're Hall of Fame was attended by 14, 13-year-olds wanting the free food. About every hand, right? Wouldn't it be cool to have a redo? I'm going to petition that we have a redo for everybody that got inducted in Tulsa. But change is coming. And, uh, you know, one of the things that happens as one of the board of directors, and by the way, I want to thank the board who brings this to life and does the vote. These men and women work very hard and diligently to bring this. But I get a lot of emails, hey, my guy should be in. My girl should be in. And I, th I agree with you, but we have a very exact process. And rather than griping about it, what I want you to do is nominate them. We have a process that's so democratic. Anybody here can nominate anybody here, but then you got to vote for them. And everybody says, that guy should have been in 20 years ago. So I say to you that say that, you should have nominated him. It ain't on me. I can't. I'm not in a position to do that. I can't show favoritism. Show your favoritism to the people you want in. We have a great process. I've studied every major Hall of Fame. Ours is the best, and it's worth getting into. So we're very excited about tonight. We're going to get the party started here. Uh, tonight, we get to say congrats. You know, well done. Way to go. Uh, this is a night where you can stand up here and go, how do you like me now? 
Uh, this is payback for all of your hard work, your sprints, your wrecks, your back teen on your arm, uh, all the high school events that you missed. This is where it all comes together. And you go, man, this was worth it. This was worth it. So we do this so that throughout the ages, your accomplishments and your recognition should never be forgotten. And you are the one who's paid the price. It is written that you show me a person skilled in their work, and I will show you a person that will serve before kings and queens and not before the obscure. So tonight, your accomplishments may be recognized and written into the stone of BMX history, and I am very excited about it. I am proud to introduce the 2017 class who will be enshrined for all time in the National BMX Hall of Fame. How fun is this? I'm just a kid that wanted to ride a bike, and here we are 50 years later. Our first inductee has always been one of my favorite writers. Uh, being from the Midwest myself, it was kind of neat. Uh, in the old days, it was Southern California versus the other guys from Southern California, and the war was between Silmar and Orange. I, you know, but the world grew. The world grew. I think Paul Freeman called them the Canoga. Thank you, I didn't have to say it. But John Pyant was a guy from the Midwest, and after I left competitive racing in 1980, he was one of the guys I followed, and I, I, he's one of the guys I rooted for, and to see his accomplishments and how long Mr. Pyant waited to be here on this evening, I couldn't be more proud to be sharing this moment with him and inducting him into the National BMX Hall of Fame. And we're gonna roll a video of Mr. Pyant. Guys, roll video. If you were paying attention in U.S. history class, you might recall that Jesse James was the most infamous Missouri outlaw. But we beg to differ. Hailing from St. Louis, Missouri, John Pyant is known in the BMX world as one of the original Missouri Outlaws. And in our own history books, he is the most legendary of them all. Beginning his BMX career in 1975, John and fellow outlaw Bob Hunt helped put the Show Me State on the BMX map. For the next 10 years, Pyant would lead the charge, going from hot shoe amateur racer to one of USA's fastest AA pros. He became a two-time amateur national champion in the NBL, was an early ABA Gold Cup champion, and a member of the Anglo-American Cup championship team, where the U.S. racers beat the socks off of England's finest. From his first pro win in San Antonio, Texas in 1982, to his greatest victory, winning the third round of the ESPN BMX series in 1983, being that it was held in St. Louis, winning in front of all his home state fans, every pro knew from then on that you never count out John Pyant. Following his retirement from BMX, John kept going fast and continued catching air, driving the 1400 horsepower Bigfoot Ford Monster Truck in demos and competitions all around the country. Throughout his career, John raced for such legendary brands as DG and Huffy and was always a valuable asset for any of his sponsors. And he was a huge role model for many of us here tonight. Please stand up and give a huge BMX welcome to your newest BMX Hall of Famer in the pioneer category, Missouri Outlaw, John Pyant. How are you supposed to follow that? All right, got a little bit here. Hopefully we can get it down. <clears throat> Thank you for the great honor of being on the stage to be inducted into the BMX Hall of Fame. In the beginning, like all of us, I was just a boy riding my bike in the field thinking I was Marty Smith on his Honda 125. Actually, my first racing number was 125. However, not on a Honda, but on a Webco, my very first real BMX bike. <clears throat> Having my plaque on the wall with the best riders ever in the sport of BMX, coming from that field to a national champion, to wins at the highest level as a pro, now to the Hall of Fame is an unbelievable feeling. Obviously, I need to thank my parents. All the time and effort that they put into my racing 
can never be forgotten, and I can't thank them enough. I honestly don't know how they did it. Looking back to the early years, local and regional racing, a very sincere thank you to my mom and my past, my late father. <clears throat> Even if he's unaware of it, I want to thank David Clinton. For some unusual reason, he made a lot of trips to St. Louis. The first was before the World Championships in Indianapolis, telling a group of young riders at a bicycle shop late one night what to expect for our very first concrete race. Years later, racing a local night race, thinking I had a chance against him, he showed me a new level of speed as I chased him around the track all night long. I became a better rider because of him. I want to thank the St. Louis racing community, all the parents, the racers, for their time and effort to make the, give us the tracks and the race days that made Missouri Outlaws a real thing. I want to thank the magazines, Bob Osborne, John Kerr, Steve Guyberson, and all the rest who made BMX look as awesome as it was, and for also making me look good in the magazines as well. The racers who I battled against in my championship years, Donnie Atherton, Tommy Brackens, Don Jolie, Nelson Chanady, Eddie King. Without you, the respect as a competitor and the battles we had would never meant so much. On the pro level, so many riders and they add to that list, along with the amateurs that moved up. The great friendships I had, the Esser family, Greg couldn't make it here tonight. Um, we still talk on a regular basis, and obviously his late brother, Brian. When Greg retired, then I hung around with the Pattersons. Uh, me and Brent had a really great uh, friendship, spent a lot of time together, water skiing, hanging out at his house. I used to live up there for about two months a year, it seemed like. And then uh, when I got onto the pro team, then Stuart Thompson, great teammate, great competitor, great friend. We had a long history afterwards of racing, riding mountain bikes in the hills outside of uh, Riverside where he lived. Without them people, it just everything just goes away. Like that's the memories you have forever. I want to thank all those who voted for me through the years, all the racers, families that I have met and spent time with, all the racers I've ever been on the gate with, made BMX an awesome sport throughout my whole career. Thank you. good was that? That is awesome. Long time coming, John. My guess is that many of you either have heard of or have raced the legendary Corona BMX track or Western Sportsorama or ridden a Powerlite or in some way or the other have benefited positively from our next inductee, Mr. Steve Rink. And he's one of those guys that was kind of lost in the midst of the beginnings of the Hall of Fame and uh, to be able to rectify that and that our community has come together to vote for him in this is astonishing. He's one of the best guys and our sport benefited in so many ways. And all he ever did was help kids. And all he ever did was reach out to people. And all he ever did was pour into others. And to be able to stand here and uh, roll his video, and we he's, he's not here tonight, so at, right after, uh, we're gonna roll an acceptance that uh, we got videoed over today. So it is an honor today to share this with you. So Ron, let's roll the video for Mr. Steve Rink. Steve Rink was an aeronautical engineer at McDonnell Douglas. To help out the local neighborhood kids, he would buy used bikes at the police auction and fix them up in the garage of their suburban home in Orange, California. Soon, with a steady flow of kids coming and going, the neighbors began to complain. And that is how Pedal Power Bike Shop began. In 1973, Rink started up and ran the track out back, Western Sportsorama, followed by the Santa Ana Elks track, and his bike shop business thrived with the BMX boom. In late 74, Rink opened one of the most legendary tracks in our sport, Corona Raceway. With its high speeds and downhill layout,
Corona set a new standard of gnarliness for our sport. Following the success of Pedal Power Cyclery, Rick started developing his own BMX frames around 1975, working with an old co-worker from McDonnell Douglas named John Johnson. His first frame, the twin top-tubed Rink Raider, was ridden by Hall of Famer Dennis Dane. While the Raider went in to inspire the earliest torquers, his next generation of frames birthed the Powerlight brand. The innovation of Steve Rink is evident in the design of the curved bar ends of the Powerlight bars with their patented power bend. And when cruiser racing first appeared on the scene, Rink was right there with one of the most iconic 26-inch cruiser frames of the day. Steve also had an eye for talent, hand-picking young riders such as Tommy Brackens, Rob Fade, Mark Darcy, Kirk Crisco, and Brian Ramazinski. You could easily say that Steve Ring had that Midas touch. Everything he started eventually turned gold. Decades later, long after Rink formed that first Powerlight team for his son Mark, Powerlight would go on to become the number one factory team in the ABA. Not once, but twice. Many years after selling his bike shop to Bob Osborne, being run by Jeff Potima and switching ownership to Rob Lynch, Pedal Power would win a number one bike shop title in the ABA. Tonight, we honor the man responsible for a long-lasting brand, an iconic bike shop, and two legendary BMX tracks. Without Steve Rink's early vision for our sport, our BMX history books would be missing quite a few chapters. Please stand and salute the man who started it all, Steve Rink. So Mark, why don't you come up and accept for your dad real quick and then we're gonna roll his video right after. So give it up for Mark Rink, the Kabuki Good Kid. My name is Steve Rink. Wow, I never thought this was gonna happen. John, who's, who's gonna wait longer? Us or you? Um, I just want to humbly uh, accept this award for my mom, as well as my dad. All I did was just want to help the kids out there. And uh, Dennis, I want to thank you for giving me the Rink Raider tonight. <laughs> All right, watch the video and uh, enjoy. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Steve Rink. And I, first of all, I want to thank my son, Mark Rink, for nominating me to the Hall of Fame. I know you, some of you are wondering why this old guy got nominated to the Hall of Fame. Well, let me tell you, I was in BMX from the very beginning. I lived in Orange County 40 years ago, and I started BMX from the very beginning. And through my efforts, BMX caught on like a California wildfire. And after a year, there was over a thousand BMX riders in Orange County. And I built and operated three separate successful BMX tracks. And the first track I built was in the city of Orange, and it was behind some batting cages, and the batting cages were called Western sports Arama. So the track I built, the kids called it WSA. And every Friday night, we'd run races. And I was lucky I had some good help from the wife, Nancy. And Nancy and I have been married for 54 years. And can you imagine that, married to the same woman for 54 years? 
I should be in the Marriage Hall of Fame. But I'm not going there. I'm going to stick to the BMX Hall of Fame. So, thank you. And every Wednesday, or every Friday at 4 o'clock, Nancy would go over to WSA, and she'd take care of the sign-ups. She'd collect the entry fees, she'd figure out the motos, and she'd post the starting race lineup. And at 6 o'clock every Friday, I closed my bike shop, and I had a successful bike shop called Pedal Power, and I closed the bike shop at 6 o'clock, and I went over to WSA, and we ran races. Every Friday night, we had races. And WSA became a very popular track. And if you were into BMX racing, Friday night is where you wanted to be, at WSA. And WSA became very popular and it became a very famous track because it was where legendary pro riders like Stu Thompson, Greg Hill, and Rob Fade got their start racing. The second track I promoted was Corona Downhill. And Corona Downhill was right off the 91 freeway and they had a racetrack there called Corona Raceway. And every Saturday they'd race stock car races. So behind Corona Raceway, they had a big piece of property. And one corner of the property was a big starting hill. And I thought this would be perfect for a downhill track. I thought we'd have a starting gate on the top of the hill and halfway down the hill we'd have some big gnarly jumps and on the bottom of the hill we'd have a big wide sweeping turn. So I ran the idea past the owners of Corona Raceway and they said yeah this sounds like a good idea let's try it. So every Sunday afternoon we ran races on Corona Raceway. And Corona Downhill became a very popular track and all the kids that raced WSA raced downhill at Corona Raceway. And unfortunately, Corona Raceway was great for the bike shop, but for the wife and I, it wasn't really worth it. We were busting our ass all day Sunday running races and we were lucky to break even. So I said, the heck with this nonsense. And we switched Corona Raceway over to big downhill races. And every year we'd have three or four big races. And we had really nice big trophies. And of course I jacked up the entry fees to make the big races profitable. So since I dropped Corona Raceway from the Sunday schedule, I had a free Sunday. And the bike shop was closed on Sunday. So I started another track in Santa Ana, and it was at the Santa Ana Elks Club. And it was a very successful track. And kids from all over Orange County race there every Sunday. And of the three tracks I had, I think the Elks Club was the most successful and the most popular track. And Monday through Friday, or Monday through Saturday, I ran the bike shop called Pedal Power. And thanks to my involvement in BMX racing, Pedal Power became a very popular and a very profitable bike shop. 
I sold a ton of BMX parts and I sold quite a few BMX bikes. And nationwide, Pedal Power became the number one BMX bike shop. And as if I didn't have enough on my plate, I started another business called Powerlight. And Powerlight manufactured chromoly frames and forks. I had frames and forks all the way from many to beach cruiser. And Powerlight also had a complete line of handlebars. And nationwide, I sold a couple thousand handlebars. Powerlight also had a BMX racing team. And I sponsored several young riders on Powerlight bikes. And most of them raced in a Powerlight uniform. And it became a very popular promotional idea. And Powerlight became a very recognizable brand name. Powerlight also had a factory team. And I was lucky enough to pick up a pro rider, a very likable guy named Tommy Brackens. And Tommy Brackens was a very fast rider. He had a nickname, the Human Dragster. And Tommy had bionic legs, because Tommy was fast. And there wasn't any pro rider that could hang with Tommy on the straightaway. And I want to tell you about one race I remember with Tommy, and Tommy and I had a sponsorship deal, and we did it on a handshake only. And it worked fine for me, and I think it worked fine for Tommy, because Tommy never mentioned a signed contract, and he never even brought the subject up. So the first race I remember taking Tommy to was the ABA race up north. And Tommy and I went to the race in the Powerlight van. Tommy signed up as a pro rider in the pro class. And during the qualifying motos, Tommy demonstrated his human dragster routine. And at the end of the qualifying races, Tommy qualified in the pro main event. So during the start of the pro main event, the gate dropped and the human dragster took off like a rocket. Tommy was the first rider to the big jump. And Tommy's expertise was fast starts out of the gate. And he was not an expert in big jumps. So Tommy took the first jump wrong, and Tommy crashed hard. He really crashed. He went splat. And it was bad. I could tell Tommy was hurt, because he was laying on the ground, and it took Tommy a while to get up. So Tommy finally got up, and he hobbled back to the power light van. And we're sitting in the van, and Tommy was in the back of the van, licking his his sore his sores, and this little kid came riding up on his bicycle, and I think the kid was only seven or eight years old. He was a cute little kid, and the kid said, "Tommy, I'm really sorry you crashed. Could I please have your autograph?" And Tommy said, sure, kid. And Tommy somehow climbed out of the van. He stood up in front of the kid. He shook the kid's hand. He gave the kid a power light sticker. And he gave the kid an autograph. And I thought to myself, this Tommy Brackens, he's a class act. 
Because if I was Tommy, I would have said, get away from me, kid. Can't you see I'm bleeding? And Tommy didn't say that. His parents raised him better than that. And Tommy s said the right thing, and he did the right thing. So I thought sponsoring Tommy Bracken was a great power light move. And some of my fondest memories in BMX are going to races with Tommy. Tommy did a wonderful job promoting Powerlight, and Tommy, I really appreciate it. And now in closing, I'd like to say thank you very much for nominating me in the Hall of Fame. It's an honor to be in the Hall of Fame and I thank you all, and to my son Mark and Tommy, thank you for your help. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be in the Hall of Fame. So God bless you all, and thank you very much. Good night. That was kind of awesome. <laughs> so we got the Grands coming up here in a while. And BMX is in pretty good shape. I'm curious if we're going to break the record of, I think, 765 motos. And that may not be exciting to you, but that jacks me up. And that's, that's an exciting time. And we've got a lot of titles coming up. There's seven national titles up for grabs. I believe Elise Post has won like 50. I, I don't remember but I think she's up for her 10th title in a row. And Elise, I'm gonna point out that this is my 10th year in a row, so I'm probably your good luck charm. I just wanna say that, so. Anyway, um, a guy that's won a few titles, and one of the prestigious titles is the amateur title, and it takes a lot of work, and you can't luck your way into it. Uh, you, you're not gonna get in by just an accident. And our next inductee, I am so thrilled to be part of this ceremony tonight with Doug Davis. Uh, one of the guys I followed intensely and as part of the legendary team that he was part of, there was nobody like him and we really haven't seen a writer like him since. And it is so awesome tonight uh, to share with you the video of Mr. Doug Davis. Roll video. When you think of Diamondback Racing, there are three names that come to mind. Harry Leary, Eddie King, and Doug Davis. Having discovered BMX in 1976, Doug soon got the attention of Sandy Finkelman and the famous Wheels and Things bike shop in San Diego. It took him two years to work his way up to the factory ranks, hooking up with Torker Bicycles before moving on to a seven-year sponsorship with Diamondback. As an amateur, Doug dominated his age class, consistently beating out Hall of Famers such as Mike King, Steve Veltman, Billy Griggs, and Kyle Fleming, among others. If you saw Doug's name next to yours on a moto sheet, you pretty much knew you were racing for second place. Having raced over 25 nationals a year for nearly a decade, Doug accumulated well over 120 wins. During those seven years of repetitive win streaks, triple wins, and doubles, he became ABA's 1983 national number one amateur. Starting from his 11X win at the 1980 JAG World Championships in Indy, all the way to being named a member of the BMX Action second generation of Terrible 10, winning was his business, and business was good. Over the past four decades, San Diego's BMX scene has bred some of the best racers in our sport. 
and Doug Davis is a living legend amongst those superstars. After retiring in 1989 after a short stint as pro, Davis left a mighty big impression on our sport. Please give a rousing welcome to your newest racer inductee into the BMX Hall of Fame, Doug Davis. Thank you all for being here this evening. What an honor it is. And I got to tell you before I begin with my prepared speech, I want to just recognize the Kyle Fleming's family. Um, I haven't seen them in 39 years. And they came here today, especially to see me get inducted. And that touches my heart like you can't believe. Kyle was a great racer and I loved him. All right, it feels so good to finally be a member of the BMX Hall of Fame class of 2017. It's a great honor to share the stage tonight with my fellow inductees, Misty, John, Steve, and Dave. I want to congratulate you and your families this evening and hope you enjoy this special time together. I would like to thank USA BMX and all the voting members for the induction and this amazing ceremony here this evening. Being at the Olympic Training Center is such a pleasure with my family, friends, uh, teammates, competitors, and the BMX Hall of Famers that made this sport what it is today. It's been some 30 years since I last rode competitively for, for Team Diamondback. This is where you're supposed to say, man, that guy looks young still. <laughs> so let me give you a little snapshot of my life now. I've been married to my beautiful wife, Susan Davis, for the last 16 years, and our relationship dates back to high school. Susan, yes. Susan lives life with a lot of passion and intensity for perfection. She really does. Our home in Alpine, I'm telling you, everybody that visits it, it's just a beautiful place, and she treats it with love and care. She's just recently retired herself uh, after a 20-year career where she was top in her field. And the thing that I'm most proud of is when we went to her retirement party, the people that she worked with and her clients all said that Susan was a top performer, but she did it with humility and she treated people with respect. Susan is next to her mom and dad this evening, which I love very much as well. I also have a 24-year-old daughter, Jessica Olson. She's married to a United States Navy SEAL. And uh, a year and a half ago, I got my first granddaughter, little Miss Odessa. And then my, uh, my grandson is set to be born on uh, January 2nd, my birthday. So you never know. There might be, a, there might be another future BMXer out there. When she's not having babies, my little Jessica, she's followed her dad into the gym and she's all also followed her dad into the car business. And I'm really proud of her. I really am. So me, I've made my living for the last 25 years in the car business and being the general manager at Kearney Pearson Ford and Kia here in San Diego for the last 13 years. All of us at the dealership are most proud of the accomplishments that we do. We really have a team that's intense and passionate about taking care of the customer and success. We've grown that dealership to one of the largest dealerships in the nation and employees and sales. Um, and I'm most proud of my team. For the last three out of four years, we've earned the triple crown, which only 24 dealerships in the nation out of 3,000 earn. My current passion is enjoying weekends with Susie and listening to her intently on all the shopping explorations that she does. <laughs> Golfing, weightlifting, hiking, and driving performance vehicles with my friends. To my friends here this evening, you are all amazing people in your own right, and I have great respect and love for you. And I love our life in Alpine together. You all have special talents in your own right and are deserving of many accolades. Okay, to my mom, my dad, and my brother. 
This evening is really about you. And I know I'm up here on the stage, but you are the driving factor behind this achievement. The opportunity to race BMX and the commitment you all made with family treasure, family time, was something when I look back, I will never be able to repay you enough. What you did for me was not a one weekend commitment in the dirt at a racetrack. It was an entire 11 year sacrifice and a lifestyle based upon the sport of BMX. Mom, you allowed your husband to devote his entire weekends to me in the beginning before my, most of my races were out of town. You gave up weekends, extra money, family time around the home that most people look forward to after working a long week. You put me first, Mom, and took a back seat for many years while I was allowed to realize my dreams in the sport of BMX. As an adult, I know how hard it can be to raise a family, maintain a marriage, keep the house up. And mom, my words are not powerful enough to describe the love I have for you. Mom, I'm so proud that you kept our family together and you're a wonderful ex example of a woman who put family above all. Dad, the admiration, love, and respect I have for you will never leave my soul. When I think of leadership and the word man, I think of you and the way you've lived your life. The sacrifices you made for me to realize my dreams are countless. Both in BMX and in baseball, I could always count on my dad to do whatever it took to ensure my success. The countless weekends, countless sacrifices you made for me, dad, were the reason why I worked harder than anybody to win. I never wanted to let you or mom down, and I still don't today. I love you, Dad. Thank you for being such a great father. One last item about our household. There was no crying or sympathy for a BMX loss. There was no comfort pony, no participation trophy. My parents were much stronger than that. I had to take re personal responsibility and come back th uh, strong through intensity, passion, and a, a desire to be number one, to be the next race champion. And I'm so thankful for my mom and dad about that. Sandy Finkelman. I can't thank Sandy enough. He was a true visionary, the owner of Wheels and Things Bike Shop, team torker manager, and team, Dim team Diamondback manager. He was, he was the one who broke through so all this personally could happen for you that are racers. He had the first major budget team. In fact, Team Diamondback's budget was unlimited. It was awesome, because we sold so many of those Harry Larry turbos. <laughs> Sandy, I want you to rest in peace tonight and know one of the kids that you picked out is in the Hall of Fame. My teammates that are here this evening from Wheels and Things Torker and Diamondback, first from Team Torker, Mike Aguilera and his family here from Las Vegas. Jason Jensen, what an awesome experience that was to tour the country together with Eddie. You all made me feel extremely special last night at the event and today on our bike ride. My teammates here from, uh, tonight from Team Diamondback, Eddie King, Harry Leary, Sean Allstott, and his father, Kevin, who came from Fort Dodge, Iowa, to be here this evening. Rick Palmer and John Copeland. To be a member of Team Diamondback was like being in the big leagues. We were treated to the absolute best and the absolute best was expected of us. To show up at a BMX track and adorn that Diamondback uniform is something only a few got to experience. I remember the looks from all the kids at the track, all around the tracks or all around the country of awe and respect for the silver and black. Our equipment, accommodations, compensation, food, money, all made us feel like we could accomplish anything we set out our minds to do. To be on Team Diamondback was every BMX kid's dream. It was the most sought after sponsorship in the nation, and we all have the honor and the brotherhood of saying that we rode 
for the legendary Team Diamondback, and I'm so proud of all my teammates. <laughs> Harry and Eddie, you were the two greatest BMX, two of the greatest BMX racers of all time. I could talk for over 10 minutes just about you and what you've meant for the sport and the riders you shared a uniform with. But the compliment that comes to mind the most, you treated us younger teammates with great respect and made sure we were always safe, except while driving us in rental cars. <laughs> My competitors, wow. I wanted to beat you so bad. Every time I could just taste it. Listen, I'm 48 years old tonight, and the first thing that I thought when I saw some of you this evening is I can still take them. I have great respect for Billy Griggs, Mike King, Chris Torres, Mr. Kyle Fleming, Gary Renteria, Steve Veltman, Terry Tanette, Peter Cassano, Darwin Griffin, Brian Gass, Craig Bark, and Carl Butler, and all the others over the years that I had the pleasure of competing against. Our sport was an individual sport where it was only you to blame if you won and only you to take the credit for a loss. Oh, the similarities of adult life, huh? Guys, I took the lessons I learned from the sport of BMX and the lessons I got from the victories and defeats and translated them into the workplace and into life. BMX competition and the experiences gained by traveling the country and having to prove that I deserved to wear the Diamondback uniform year in and year out made me always think there was nothing I couldn't achieve if I, didn't, if I worked hard enough. After not making the big leagues and struggling for a couple years at the age of 23, I woke up and said, hey, Doug, it's time to start training for life like you trained on a BMX bike. You have to work harder, longer than the competition in the workplace, and you'll become factory sponsored by your job. You think I'm crazy, but all the salespeople that I started selling against, I named them after my competition. <laughs> the top salesman, was named Mike King, and I looked at that guy every single day and I said, I gotta beat him, gotta beat him. <sighs> life is not always perfect and I've had major setbacks in life, just like many of you. Divorce, loss of my first job in the car business after a, something crazy after 11 years. Susie and I have had uh, times of struggle. But during the most difficult times in life, I always realized, I always relied, excuse me, on the experience I had racing my BMX bike to provide a spark. Being a part of a team and something special like Team Diamondback gave me the confidence to keep moving forward at all costs and realize my goals and dreams. In closing, I am, for, I am forever grateful for the honor tonight. If you ever thought that Doug Davis turned his back on the sport of BMX because I left so abruptly, I want you to now know this sport lived in my heart and soul. Thank you so much. Right, you heard it at the Hall of Fame. There is no comfort pony. <laughs> Man, that was good. I took the lessons from victory and defeat and turned them into lessons that benefited me in business later in life. That's what BMX is about. Boy, this next one is so special. Um, in the old days, we called the girl racers powder puff. If you've seen Elise Post's legs, they ain't powder puffs. Can I say that? I, I said that, so it's out there. Um, I, I met Misty through the Hall of Fame experience. Misty Dong's gonna be up here in a minute. She was a member of the legendary Patterson team and competed at a high level in all the sanctions and did well everywhere she went. 
And what an honor tonight to stand on the stage with my friend, Misty Dong. And let's roll the video. Play Misty for me. In the earliest days of bicycle motocross, racing was a rough and tumble activity. The majority of riders were teenage boys. Very few girls had what it took to hang with the guys on these rocky, dirt clod infested goat paths that we called BMX tracks. That is, until Northern California's Misty Dong came along. Starting out in the mid 70s, Misty was fast from the very beginning winning dozens of national events in multiple sanctions, including a class win at the first ever ABA Grands in 1978. While that was a first, it wasn't her last. She would go on to do it again in 1980. Winning at the Grands soon became a habit as she won the UBR and NBA Grands in 1979 and 1981. Back in a time when factory sponsorship for girls was a rare offer, Misty represented some of the biggest brands in BMX. From Patterson Racing to George Anthill's Raleigh BMX team, she helped pave the way for the girls of today. In 1984, she became the first female to perform a bicycle evaluation for a major BMX magazine, testing the Raleigh R6000 in the February issue of Super BMX magazine and also appeared in two BMX TV commercials, including one for Bugle Chips with R.L. Osborne and Mike Buff. Living the dream of every teenage girl at the time, Misty was chosen as one of the only girl racers in the infamous BMX episode of Chips, getting to hang out with John and Ponch. Anybody remember the BMX scene in the movie Uncommon Valor starring Gene Hackman? Yeah, Misty was in that one too. In her prime, she was a tough competitor and an inspiration for every girl who ever threw a leg over a BMX bike. Just ask the BMX Hall of Fame's very first female inductee, Sherry Elliott, and she'll tell you that her first BMX idol was Misty Dong. So please, get up out of your seats and put your hands together for your 2017 woman inductee into the National BMX Hall of Fame, Misty Dong. Thank you so much. It um, it means a lot to me. Yeah. I have stuff written down here, and I need to read it because if not, I'll probably cry. <laughs> um, first, I would like to start by saying thank you to USA BMX for the honor of this great event and for helping BMX become an Olympic sport. And I'm sure, and for female racers being able to race professionally. I sure wish it was an Olympic sport back when we raced, and I'm sure most of you guys do too. I would like to say thank you to my sponsors. First, my mom and dad. My first local bike shop sponsor, Ron's Bike Shop, Ron Peck. My factory, uh, Patterson Racing Products, Gene and John Vance Patterson, my, and Factory Raleigh. Um, thank you guys for choosing me. It means a lot. It's still kind of surreal to think what I did back in the mid-70s and 80s would come to this recognition. I never imagined till I got on the ballot. Then I thought, what do I do? What if I get in? <laughs> oh, God, I have to give a speech. <laughs> then I thought, I really want to get in, but I don't really want to give a speech. <laughs> I really want to give, but I don't really want to give a speech. So here I am, giving the speech I don't want to give. <laughs> so, so here's how it all got started. I asked my dad for a new bike, and he said, if you get all A's and B's on your next report card and you save half the money, then 
I will pay for half the bite. So I got all A's and B's and I saved the money. And he took me to the local bike shop and I saw this candy apple red anodized frame on the wall. And I thought, I wanted that, but I didn't know what it was and I didn't know what it was for. And so the guy at the bike shop said, um, they race them at this track and it's called Sprockets. And uh, he gave me a flyer and we went out and we watched the races and I thought, I want to do that. And so we went back, we bought the frame and it was a, uh, a prototype FMF. And uh, my dad put all these like steel junky parts on the bike and I went out and raced and I raced the boys because there wasn't any girls then. And uh, I fell all three times <laughs> because, uh, but I was leading, but I had no clue how to take a jump. So, uh, but I was fast, fearless and had no skill, but I was hooked. <laughs> and so the training began and my dad built this loop track in the backyard and I did 100 gates a day and learned how to take jumps and berms. But the big goal was to be able to pedal all the way around the first term at Sp Sprockets Track. I eventually accomplished that, and that got me recognized by factory teams. There was a Christmas uh, national race at Sprockets where I raced Richie Anderson and Gary Laurent. Um, <laughs> And at that race, I was able to pedal all the way around the first corner. And as Gary Laurent recalls and tells me that I passed him on that corner. I did come into a close second to Richie though, but that led to my getting noticed by Vance because Richie was on Patterson at the time. And that led to my factory Patterson sponsorship. Uh, I also had many great opportunities racing BMX, as mentioned as the Uncommon Valor. I did a uh, Bugle potato chip commercial riding side hacks with Mike Buff and R.L. Osborne and Valerie McKiernan that aired in Japan. And then obviously the, the infamous chips episode. I'd like to say thank you to Bob Osborne because he was instrumental in uh, many of those opportunities. Um, needless to say, BMX became a foundation for my life. Uh, it taught me how to train, to work really hard at something you care about. It taught me how to win, the thrill of victory, the sense that your hard work paid off, how to lose, the agony of defeat, and how to handle it gracefully and train harder, how to crash, tuck and roll, <laughs> how to be a, a bike mechanic, how to be factory sponsored, to represent a manufacturer with pride and dignity. Had to travel, running through airports as a young kid, carrying my bike bag, my helmet bag, my suitcase, and a trophy. People would stare at this tiny girl lugging all this through the airport, trying to catch a connecting flight. Had to miss school and still pass my classes. Um, how much my dad and mom loved me. My dad's tireless, love making leather number plates and pads for my bikes and hand machining parts to make them lighter so that I could go faster. And him figuring my gear ratios, you know, from 54s all the way to, you know, 42s and then the rears all the way from, you know, 14s to 23s, figuring them out. So, but most of all, BMX gave me a foundation for the rest of my life that no matter what challenges I faced, I would go back to my BMX roots and remember the things I learned and what I accomplished and who I am. And of course, I would just get back on my bike and ride and somehow that would put life back in perspective again. That's how I've dealt with the trials and adversities that life brings. I still do this today. So here I am and there's some people that I like to thank. Um, Brent and Brian Patterson for looking after me on tour. Um, they taught me many things. Uh, I still remember the music they played on the tours and uh, this foreigner, I'm going to win, you know, and Queen, um, another one bites to dust and then Devo whip it, right? So then there was a theme going on here with these guys, right? So 
that was their theme, and that's and they did a lot of that, you know. So I learned that. I'd also like to thank um, Perry Kramer. He's been a real friend to me the whole time, and uh, it means a lot. He's been a lifelong friend. <laughs> and and with that, David Clinton and, and Jeff Kosmala are a part of that friendship and brotherhood. These guys have my back, and that means a lot. And, and John Carr, who's been there from the beginning of time, has been a lifelong friend. Thank you very much. Yeah. The best part about BMX is our teammates and the lifelong friends that we call BMX families. Here's to 40 years of friendship and many more. You all are truly special, and I know there's probably so many more I should have thanked, okay? But I'm doing the best I can. Thank you very much for this honor. Really appreciate it. Man, San Diego has had so many great riders from the King Brothers and the Hudson Brothers and many great tracks, but we also had freestyle riders from here, and it's exciting uh, to talk about uh, Dave Volker. I, I love this part of, of the ceremony here, and this is, this is one of the good guys. I got to meet him and his family out front, and BMX is so special that we are a family right here, but when you bring your family and... Man, it, it is such a great honor to present to Dave Volker and his family, and I know who have supported him greatly, and I have as well as a fan. So we are ready to roll the video for Dave Volker. All right, here we go. Known as The Lord, Dave Volker grew up riding in San Diego's thriving freestyle scene of the 1980s. On the thriving contest scene, Lord Volker has always been known for going big, earning him the 1987 AFA Masters 19 and over Vert Championships, and both a silver and bronze X Games medal 10 years later. With an impeccable reputation as the world's greatest show rider, Volker was originally schooled by the master showman himself, Brian Skura. Over the past 30 years, Lord Volker has performed at over 5,000 freestyle shows at schools, state and county fairs, and even NBA and NFL halftime shows, and still puts on quite a show to this day. Whether at a contest, show, photo shoot, or practice session, Dave has never just ridden up to an obstacle. He attacks it like a rabid dog, going bigger and burlier than anyone else. From his patented foot plants on a vert ramp, to his trademark lookdowns, to his invention of the tail whip nose pick, there is good reason he's called the Lord Almighty. Having adorned the covers of every major BMX magazine, as well as catalog covers for Dino and GT, Volker has always been one of the most photogenic riders in our sport. His legacy in the freestyle scene has always been go big or go home. And the Lord never went home. Get on your feet and let him hear it. The louder you are, the better his speech will be. Introducing your 2017 freestyle inductee into the BMX Hall of Fame. Our dear Lord, Dave Volker. Say I'm nervous uh, is an under, understatement. I feel like I'm at the X Games right now. Oh my goodness. Where do I start? First, I'm going to thank the USA BMX for having freestyle as part of their uh, 
induction. It's it's so cool to be here with everybody, and they do such a great job. Give it up for USA BMX. Awesome, awesome job. Awesome job. I'm going to start in the 70s because uh, things started real quick for me. I remember as a kid, of course, Evil Knievel was my hero, so... Uh, you know, I, I wanted to be like him right away. I felt it. I was like, man, I got to do something cool. So there was a wall across the street, and I went over there, and I jumped off of it. And that was on a big wheel. It really was. Like, I remember that moment. It was like the adrenaline was going, and I was, that was me. That's what I wanted to do. So uh, as I was getting older, you know, I get my first bike. I learned how to ride it. And uh, I ended up learning my first trick, which was the skid and I was good at it. I did them long. I could do like 12 of the squares on the sidewalk. It was a long skid. But unfortunately, my bike didn't have inner tubes and it got flat spots every time I did it. So a week later, that bike was done. I was chipping teeth riding down the street. So uh, I went from that to the boards and bricks and I was jumping really far on those. And we started putting it right in front of the curb and we had jumped to see how far we could move them back from the curb and the kids were measuring it. The older kids were really good at provoking me on doing this kind of stuff. So they get me going further and further until I blow my wheel up. So uh, after that, my dad made me some ramps and uh, rest in peace, Dad. He did a really, <sighs> he did, uh, he built me these big green ramps and uh, they were pretty popular. People knew about them in uh, the East County. They would come over and ride, but the older kids, kids once again, they start testing me. They want me to make it further and further. They got measuring tapes. They're, it, it was getting really big and dangerous, and all of a sudden, my mom comes running out, and she's all, stop, stop, you're going to kill them. It was awesome. I was jumping big at a very young age. So uh, that's what I, I, I wanted to thank my mom for all the years of... Uh, picking me up, taking me to the hospital, and always supporting me over the years, Mom. I love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I wanted to thank my uh, sisters, Sherry and Beth. Uh, I, I was out on the road all the time, like all the time, and uh, they were always there to support me with raising my children, helping out whenever I needed it. I love you. Thank you, Sherry and Beth. Um, Katie and Cole, wow. My two children, I have a 17 and an 18 year old and uh, they are turning out so awesome. They've been through so much and uh, I love you guys to death. They're awesome. My wife, Erica, we just had a brand new baby boy, Asher. And uh, I know how old he is. My two year old son, Vander. I, I'm so shaken right now, it's awesome. So uh, Erica, love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And. Uh, I'm going to get into this whole uh, how freestyle started for me. This is a pretty cool way it started. I was a wheelie king of the world, but my world was Corita Court up to Bellagio. It wasn't a very big world, but I was a wheelie king, and uh, I was jumping really far at this time. It was eighth grade summer, and this kid moved into the street, uh, into the neighborhood of the street up around the corner, and he uh, was able to do a trick, and the trick was called a rock walk. And... Uh, I had to learn it. Like, this guy was better than me. He could ride long wheelies and do the rock walk. So him and I started doing tricks together, and that's how it all started. Like, we were rolling down the street backwards, see who could get further, and then we got really good at it. And then we'd go down to the roller rink and show off our new tricks. And that's where showing off really got going for me. I was, yeah, I was addicted. I wanted to make people smile, you know? And uh, it worked out pretty good. <laughs> Um, Valley Bikes was my sponsor at the, at a early age and, uh, Sandy over there, she, uh, was good friends with Byron Friday at SE and, uh, they decided to force me to go to a contest and I was in my little shell. I didn't want to go to a contest or whatever. So, um, they talked, talked me into going, Byron gave me the bike, he gave me a bike, he gave me, uh, leathers, he gave me a jersey that actually were Toby Henderson's with the letters peeled off so you can still read it. But they set me up and uh, I went to the contest, I did good, and that's how my career started. I uh, got recognized, I was working at a metal shop at the time and uh, this, I get a 
strange phone call, and uh, it ended up being Brian Skura. Good old Brian Skura called me up, and uh, he came down, brought some ramps, tried me out, and then he uh, ended up having me do some shows up, I believe, the uh, Orange County Fair. And uh, I was doing some crazy things with Brian. Brian had me wearing George Jet Jetson master and shows coming out behind the ramp, you know, meet George Jetson. <laughs> and then uh, he, he was the best teacher, though. He, he knew I loved to make a crowd smile. And then he uh, taught me how to do it like in, in life, how to make people smile. For an example, we were in a McDonald's and he couldn't decide what to order. He was sitting there making a pretty big scene about it. I don't know what to do. He's all, I know what to do. I'll flip for it. So he just stands there and does a backflip right there in McDonald's. Like that's the kind of guy he was, but he got me out of my shell and taught me how to entertain people. And uh, thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate that. Um, oh, man, this part. I got a couple tour friends to thank. Um, 27 years on the road, man. I have, I, had a, I have a lot of friends, definitely. I'm gonna start off with my two best friends. I got Brian Blyther and Mike Perenni, man. I love you guys. Yeah. Dave Norrie came down from Oregon today. I love you, Dave. Thank you, thank you. I really gotta thank this guy, it's Gabe Weed. We'd be on tour. I toured with him for so many years and he was kind of the tour mom. He had the uh, chocolate covered express, espresso beans. Like he was always that guy that supplied things, took care of things. Thank you, Gabe Weed. Love you. Uh, Rob Nolly, toured with him for years. Robert Castillo, man, me and him and I, would, we've been tour, uh, whew teammates for years and years and years. And then uh, he started his own company, the BMX Freestyle Team. I started doing shows for him doing that. If you ever need a show, Robert's the one. BMX Freestyle Team. Thank you, Robert. Um, sponsors, Matt Hoffman, man. He, he supplied bikes for me. Um, he, uh, he was a hero for one thing. I mean, literally a hero to me. And I don't have many heroes in life. That guy is a true hero. Um, supplying bikes and then actually when uh i wasn't with gt bicycles anymore after 15 years um matt ended up having me do shows with him out at universal orlando and i ended up doing shows there for six years i met my beautiful wife there and uh yeah thank you matt hoffman very cool um gary laurent also thank you gary drove out from vegas to be here and race of course but Gary's a great guy, and uh, he supplied a lot of shows for me over the years. I even got a cruise ship job from him. It was really cool working on a cruise ship. Uh, let's see. I have John Pova from Etnies, a great guy and true friend. Um, Mark Skirto from Oakley, man. He was, he's, he's a really good friend, and we're both trying to see who could be older still making babies. <laughs> Xavier Mendez, the old school BMX team manager. Thank you, X-Man, I love you. John Bulgeens, I don't know how to say it properly, John. I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> but thank you, John. And uh, I wanted to thank, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen Joyce out here signing, but uh, I wanted to thank Joyce for signing for my good buddy, Gary Clark. Gary's been around for years. If, you, if you're a writer from San Diego, you've ridden with Gary somewhere down the line. Gary's a great guy. So I'm pretty much uh, done, except for I have to share my, uh, my final two biggest compliments. And it, it, I, these things changed my life. I was uh, not sponsored yet. I was down at the Santee Lakes bass fishing, Lake 2, right under the bridge, but the bridge didn't exist yet. But there were trees, and on the other side of the trees, there were these jumps. And I'll never forget this. I'm fishing by myself, and all of a sudden I hear the kids talking, and they're like, look, I'm Dave Volker, one-footed tabletop. And I was like, my heart started pounding, and it was just such a great feeling. I just, I wish I knew who those kids were, man, because that, that was really cool. That was... And then I, a lot of you are going to know this place. It was uh, Bercy Stadium, 1987. I went there, the huge BMX race, and we got to do the halftime for you guys. And it was amazing how many people were in this stadium. So we do our halftime, a little show, Rick Mullen Turner and I. And uh, 
as I'm doing the show, you know, it's all spotlights and everything. I do this Volker fly out thing where I jump out of the ramp and I act like I'm crashing, flailing my arms and I land on top and I raise my arm and all of a sudden the crowd just went <sighs> and it was like a rock star is going on. What? And I got so like scared I had to get down off the ramp. But that was that that was kind of my feeling of I did it. I did it. I'm making people smile. I love it. I just want to thank you guys for uh, making me smile. Good night. That was awesome. Kind of like to watch that video again. By the way, shout out to Jason Lycom, the voice of all the videos, Wisconsin BMXer. All right, thank you, Jason. I'm guessing that many of you have heard of uh, BMX Action Magazine. And uh, back in the day, back in starting 1979, they had an award called the Nora Cup. And uh, that went on for about 10 or 11 years. It was picked up by Go and Tonight, we celebrate the 21st Nora Cup presented by Ride BMX. And uh, we absolutely are thankful that they've continued this great tradition. And uh, if you go back to 1979, the very first Nora Cup winner, there actually wasn't a cup, but it was my good friend, Bobby Encina. So Bobby, can you come up here and give me a hand? Want to bring the cup up here? <laughs> All right, so we we about ready to roll the video here. So we're going to roll the video. Bobby and I are going to present this in a little bit, and we're going to share the five nominees for the 2017 Ride BMX Nora Cup. Roll it, guys. Corbin Shara. All right. There you go. Okay. Cool.
really have much. I mean, um, up here were some of the greats. I mean, everybody in, that were nominees had an awesome year. Everybody's had multiple wins. And um, just an honor to be up here and have this, I mean, have this cup. Like I said, there's multiple guys, multiple wins. And, and I mean, this cup is one of the greatest because it's not really fan-based or, or anything like that. It's actually, it's writer picked. So um, this has a really cool place in my heart to be picked amongst the guys that I've lined up in the gate with and, and everybody like that. So means a lot. I mean, it's it's super cool. And um, thanks to all the riders, everybody I line up with, my wife, family, everybody that supports BMX, USA BMX, USA Cycling, everybody that makes this happen, everybody in the sport of BMX and supports it and loves it. Um, thank you guys and thanks for picking me. Man, that was awesome. Yes, it's cool to work in BMX like this because I'm a fan of the sport and all the people, the new guys who are doing such a great job that we have world champions here that we have a gold medal here last year. We were picking out the team and they brought home the medals and it was awesome. And I'm so happy with the sport of BMX. I'm happy to hear Misty say you can fall down your first three times and you end up in the Hall of Fame. I'm happy that Gary Turner's still welding frames after 45 years. And that Craig is carrying on the legacy. And by the way, the, how good is our sport? I mean, Lisa's raising money with Craig and Gary, and they've got some raffle tickets. They're going to give all the money away uh, to people affected, I think, by the hurricanes. And that's the heart of our sport. And I, I, if you got an extra 20, let's go get that bike, uh, make a difference with it. So, you know, I think the message that you heard tonight, and what a, what a great induction class that it's my 10th year doing this, and I, I couldn't be more excited than when I got the news who we were putting in. But I think the message you'll hear from each of the speakers is that everybody here tonight has faced a trial. They faced something that they had to overcome, and I think that's pretty ordinary. Uh, you know, many of you will face trials today. In fact, there are people within the sound of my voice facing some great trial. And unfortunately, what you did, if you're a praying type person, you prayed for courage but unfortunately, courage is only necessary where there's something fearful going on. And, but facing those trials and even the ones that we have in BMX is just part of life. And Doug, I appreciated your comments and I appreciated your openness and what you shared about your life. That is awesome. So we've conquered those fears. We faced up to them. Sometime we got knocked on the ground three times and we stood up and we carried on. And that's what we have to do in the sport of BMX. Tonight, they get to stand on the top of the mountain, despite all the setbacks, despite all the trials, despite all the chatter on the internet, and say, job well done. So, as our sport, as our sport goes forward, where do we go from here? And I'm curious, what part will you play in it? There's a time for action, and there's a time for reaction. And I just wanna say on a personal level, that being angry, and typing a bunch of crap on the internet, that's not an action. That's just some dude in his underwear being angry on the internet. <laughs> right now is a time for a community not complaining. Being mad is not an action. And I believe that how you do anything is how you do everything. And I just want to challenge, and, and hearing Steve Rink about opening tracks and pouring into people, if, if you want to cause things to change. If you want things to change, I challenge you, step up, change them. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. You be the change that you look for. How you do anything is how you'll always do everything. We complain loudly thinking that's the solution and it's not. And ultimately your complaining is the problem. We want to grow the sport, but it takes people to do it. It takes good people like Steve Rink to do it. It takes good people like Doug's parents to do it. It takes great people like the Flemings to come back and celebrate to do it. It takes all of us together to go get things done and then celebrate at the end of the day, just like this, under the flags of the world, under the Olympic flame, to say, we got the job done and tonight we've done that. BMX is headed in a great direction. And I wanna share with you a couple things just so you know, guys like Donnie Robinson and the program he has on and the STEM program and guys like Jace, Dr. Jason Richardson going out and teaching people not how to win just on a bike, but in life. See, they took the next step. 
Some of you are stranded in the 70s with me. I get it. But sometimes you got to step up and take the next step. BMX is taking the next step. We're in the Olympics. We're in Tokyo in 2020. That's exciting news. Uh, I, I don't know where they're going after that, but I know that some of you right now in your brain, you're saying, could I be that guy? And the answer is if you choose to be, and that's exciting. We've got guys like Greg Romero and Dale Holmes and people that are teaching others. They're breathing old life into new people. And I'm telling you, that is taking a step. That is taking an action, and I'm proud of that. Um, you know, a lot of you have looked at how BMX is run today, and I have a unique view as a volunteer and to be able to come into the sport and work with track operators. Uh, last year, I had the great privilege to be invited by USA BMX to the Track Operator Summit. Man, I was blown away. And, and maybe you don't realize it, but it takes a little while to build a business. It takes a little while to build a sport. It takes a little while to build a legacy, but I'm telling you, we're doing it right now. I sat in the room with 350 track operators for two and a half days, and I gave them one challenge. Show up, get better, learn the business, make more money. It's okay to make a little bit of money, because if we can show track operators how to do that, our sport grows. We get more frame makers and clothing makers and trainers, and everybody flourishes. And I'm looking at these people going, man, it's, it's just a big deal. And ABA spent, or USA BMX spent about $100,000 putting that event on to train people how to run the tracks better. And I got to see that from the inside. And I've got to tell you, BA and Bernie, I, I couldn't be more proud to be locked arm in arm with you. And we're doing good stuff for the sport. And I salute you. Please give it up for those guys. So we're going to turn the lights up a little bit, turn on some bumper music. My friend Ron in the back, we've got, I don't, I don't know if the bar is open or not, but uh, we're going to hang out a little bit. A bunch of us are going over to Eddie's condo, and uh, we're going to celebrate tonight. Uh, Eddie, I, is there room for 400 there? I think we can squeeze them in. Be real quiet. The neighbors are finicky. Hey, I want to thank you for letting me be part of this. Uh, I'm just a kid who liked riding his bike. Todd Lyons says, ride a bike. It will take you places. And I think each of us, whether the parent, the track operator, the manufacturer, or just the guy riding the bike like myself, I think those, those words ring truly impactful tonight. They ride a bike, it will take you places. Each of you tonight, John Pyant, I admire you. I have for so many years, and what a great night for you and your family. And Mr. Steve Rink and Mark Rink, my buddy, man, I'm so glad you kept at it because what a great honor. Doug, this was a long time coming and it took far too long, but what a great night for you and your family. Misty, I love you. You're one of the good ones. And Dave, you're just a madman. And we all get to live through you and with you. And with that, I wanna say thank you for being part of BMX. I wanna say thank you for coming to the Hall of Fame. And I look forward to whatever is next in 2018. I believe the best is yet to come, and you are the solution. Good night. Congratulations, everybody.